Hallelujah. This is the night the Lord has made, and we will rejoice because we have a choice. Amen, amen and amen and amen <clears throat> and amen. Woohoo! Glory. <laughs> Man, praise God. God is good all the time. He's faithful when, when we're faithless. He's always waiting on us to make the right decisions, to get in position. You know, as we are worshiping tonight, <clears throat> one of the things that the Holy Spirit was sharing with me, especially about what's happening right now, the things that are going on, and, and there's so much, not only attack, but division and strife and so much evil that's being exposed. And so many people are getting taken out of position. And one of the things he said to me is, you know, the word says that in, in perilous times, which we are in perilous times, uh, one of the things he warned everyone is people become lovers of themselves. And one of the things he said to me is, lovers of self meaning lovers of their own presence. Lovers of their own presence. Not even realizing that it's their presence that they're loving. So we're to be exchanging our presence for his. And everything we do, that should be some of our prayers every day. Lord, I exchange my will for your will, my heart for your heart, my desires for your desires, my presence for your presence. Because many people fall because they're still surrounded by their own presence and not by his presence. His presence breaks every yoke of bondage. His presence gives us eyes to see all the way through. Because see, people don't see things all the way through. They're short-sighted because your presence will blind you. It will bring you short-sightedness. You, can, you can't see beyond yourself your needs, your desires, your will. That's when your presence is, God, you are allowing your presence to outweigh God's presence. Amen. Does everybody understand this? Amen. And it causes, one of the things it causes is fatal decisions. Everyone say fatal decisions. Fatal decisions. First Peter chapter 5. Hallelujah. We have a teaching called Fatal Attractions. Well, fatal attractions will cause you to make fatal decisions. First Peter chapter 5, in verse 1. Is everybody there? Fatal decisions. This must be a reality for me and you. It must become a reality where it is so real that we're realizing that our presence is bringing us to us. See, we cannot see things through if our presence is in a way. You know how many times we say, well, we got in a way of God or somebody's getting... Yeah. Because our presence, our will, our desires are interfering with His. We must exchange our presence for his. That's why we worship. You know, last, what was it? Uh, last Sunday, I think it was. I had a vision during the service, or it was Friday night, I don't remember. And I saw logs of wood. And as we were worshiping, oil was being poured on the wood. And it was flaming up like crazy. And the Lord said, the, word is, the, my, the wood is the word. See, so, so many people that are getting the word but not really going after God in worship, there isn't that fire, there isn't that flame. Because, see, that flame will burn your presence and bring God's presence. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. How many of y'all want to be a partaker of the glory? Amen. Hallelujah. 
Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. In other words, respect one another. And be clothed with humility. Be humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, what? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. In other words, what you're actually doing when you're humbling yourself, you're exchanging your presence for his. Humble, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And, of course, here's the kicker. Be sober, which means be what? Alert. And he's, he explains how to be alert. Be vigilant by being what? Consistent. If you are not consistent, whoa, be alert. Being consistent. What are you consistent in? Prayer, worship, the word, fellowship. Being consistent in battle. Being consistent in humility. Being consistent in submissive. And being consistent of denying yourself. So denying yourself is associated with denying your own presence. Amen? Why? So that you can recognize. See, being alert says, I can recognize. I can see it through. If you're not alert, you won't see things through. You'll be short-sighted. You can't see beyond your own presence. In fact, your own presence is blocking everything. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking who may, may what? Devour. Now, let me tell you something. The, the way he devours individuals is influences them, influences them to make fatal decisions. That's all he can do is influence you to make a decision. It says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are, are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So you are never the only one that's going through that. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. The problem is many people never come out of the suffering. Some die in it because of a fatal decision. But if you can come out of the sufferings, what's going to happen is God will use it to perfect you, establish you, and strengthen you, and settle you so you are immovable. Again, when people don't recognize things, it causes problems. They don't even recognize that they're fighting for their own life. They don't even recognize that they're not denying themselves. They don't recognize these things because their presence is blinding them. Does everybody get this? Vital important. Because many people are falling. They're going astray. Hey, it, and, and I'm not saying they're going out back using drugs or whatever. But they're falling out of the will of God because they're fighting for their own life. It says the entanglements and affairs of the world have caused them to separate. Step in another path. You know, the enemy is a great deceiver. He can convince you that you're doing the will of God, but you're really not. Amen? One of the things he always wants you to do is get separated from a flock. He wants to separate you from accountability. He wants to separate you. So if he, it's just like the wolf that comes to the sheep and the flock of the sheep and takes one aside. Once that person is separated, they're gone. Because they begin to make fatal decisions. And there are many who don't come out of fatal decisions. Every one of us in this room has made a fatal decision at some time. Amen? But praise God, we live through it. So, you, so the purpose of this is so that you and I can recognize the trap, the snare, the voice, and the presence of the enemy's influence. Recognize. And we have a teach called uh, Stop Justifying and Start Recognizing. You know? But people don't realize that it's their own presence that's causing them to stumble. Their own presence. Hebrews chapter 10.
fatal decisions. Verse 26, Hebrews 10, 26. People made fatal decisions when they voted for Obama. <laughs> We're still suffering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse what now? 26, let's speak it. For if we sin what? Willfully. In other words, that's a fatal decision. A willful sin is a fatal decision. After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, that willful, fatal decision has removed us from the covering of Christ. You don't think the enemy wants to attack you and kill you? Woo! He's after you now. Now, if you don't have people praying for you, you're in trouble. So there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but what? A certain fearful expectation of what? Judgment and fiery indignation which will devour your adversaries. Why? Because we become an adversary. Anyone who has what? Rejected Moses' law dies without mercy and the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Snap. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people, his people. So he's talking about his own people, willfully sinning, making a fatal decision. Wow, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, you betcha. Again, there is that law of sowing and reaping involved, isn't there? Willful sinning. It's, you, know, it's, you know what is righteous and unrighteous. You know what's clean and unclean. You know what's holy and unholy. What, we're actually, what happens actually is a person turns their back on God to fulfill their desires or lust. That is called a fatal decision. And the reason for this that's happening is because they haven't re removed their own presence. They haven't removed their presence. Amen? You know, the, the, the law of the spirit of life, the, the law of the spirit of life, the formula of the law of the spirit of life is deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow him. That cannot be fulfilled in your presence. It can't be. It can only be, be fulfilled in his presence. Psalm 140. So why do we worship? Not only to be filled, but to get rid of our presence. See, that's why the Lord says, seek me with all of your heart. So when you worship him, you should be ministering to him with all of your heart. Psalm 140, verse 1. Is everybody there? Deliver, let's speak it together. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan what? Evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of ass is under their lips. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to make my steps, what? Stumble. The proud have hidden a snare for me, and cords they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. I want you to know that there are powers of darkness, demons, and territorial spirits that have been assigned to you so that you fall, you stumble. They are setting traps for you every single day and even while you sleep. In verse 6, I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear my voice, my supplications, O Lord. 
O oh God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O oh Lord, the desires of the wicked, and do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Now listen, this psalmist recognized. Does everybody get it? He recognized that there were snares and traps set against him. And he was praying for God's divine intervention. Does everybody get it? Oh, hallelujah. Why? Because they wanted his steps to stumble. So what he was, his prayer was actually bringing an arena to removing his presence for God's presence. Psalm 64. Now these snares and these traps cause us to lead to a fatal decision. Everything that the enemy is trying to do is get you to agree with him or make a fatal decision. Verse 1, let's speak it together. Hear my what? Voice, O oh God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the rebellion of the workers of iniquity, who sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the blameless, Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves. Look at they encourage themselves in an evil matter. In other words, their presence is encouraging themselves to do what? Evil. They talk of lay laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of a man are what? Deep. So we see here these secret plots, these wicked schemes, are bitter words. They encourage themselves or justify themselves with false excuses resulting in fatal decision. Psalm 11. Psalm 11 and verse 1. <clears throat> Let's speak it. In the Lord I do what? I put my trust. When? When I don't understand why I'm rejecting <laughs> <laughs> why I'm what things are going on when I don't understand what's happening I don't have to that's what I must do is I must put the word I trust you Lord why he says acknowledge me in all your ways and I'll establish your steps I'll make a way of escape for you I trust you Lord amen, amen. especially when people don't realize they're rejecting warnings and counsels of the word and the spirit and elders I trust you, Lord. Let me tell you, it will rescue from fatal decisions because your presence is influencing you. Self. That's that selfie presence, you know. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at who? The upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, who can the right, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. His countenance upholds the upright. I will put my trust in you, Lord, when I don't understand. Amen. When I don't, I don't have to understand. I just have to trust. First Chronicles 21. First Chronicles 21. Hallelujah. In verse 1. <clears throat> Is everybody there? Now Satan stood up against Israel. And he moved David to number Israel. Fatal decision. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go number 
Israel from Bathsheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, may the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are, but, because see, the Lord told David, do not number the people. But it says that Satan influenced him. Now, why did Satan, how did Satan get to influence him? Because David's presence was still there and not God's. Oh, hallelujah. He said, but may the Lord, the king, but my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants, he said. Why then does my Lord require this thing? And why should he be the cause of guilt in Israel? Why? Because the Lord told him not to. Verse 4. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Wow. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel for numbering the people. Why? Because David willfully disobeyed God. He made a fatal decision. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done this very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. Nice. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Man, take a choice because of a fatal decision. See, people don't realize that your fatal decision affects other people. There is a ripple effect to your family, your children, your job, everything. Amen? Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said again, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. <laughs> So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. As he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jezebite. Jezebite. Now, all because of one decision. See, we don't see everything that happens in our decisions. We don't see it, that ripple effect. Amen? I mean, <clears throat> we, have, we don't realize how much effect it's having on others around us and how much effect it's having on our future. That fatal decision. Second Samuel chapter 11. I'm using King David because David was known as a man after guys, God's heart, right? But he still made mistakes, didn't he? Yeah. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, in verse 1, And it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Oman, besieged Rab Rabbah. But David did what? He remained at Jerusalem. Where was he supposed to be? Out at battle. Fatal decision. 
Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he was a peeping David. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Peeping David. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not the Sheba, the daughter of Alam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, Uriah was David's, one of David's right-hand men. David's presence. See, God's presence would have been with him if he would have obeyed to go out to battle, but David disobeyed. And God's presence is, does not, God's presence is not with you under disobedience. Yours is. Hallelujah. Disobedience will remove the presence of God. In verse 3, so David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said it's Bathsheba, and so forth. In verse 4, then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so that she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Nice, fatal decision. They didn't have child support in those days. Now, David did some strange things. Now, go to verse 14. Now, in the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the front, forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. Snap. See, one thing led to another, didn't it? So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were violent men. Valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite did what? He died also. Fatal decision. Not going out to battle. He was out of position. He was led to a fatal decision because his presence was still with him. Does everybody get it? All right, let's see what happens. Let's go to chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one of the wayfaring men who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. Snap. <laughs> Thus says the Lord of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in this sight? You have killed Uriah, the Hittite, with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Decision. Fatal decision. David's sword would never rest. Never. There would always be battle. 
until he was no longer king. Therefore the sword shall not depart from your house <clears throat> because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up an adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Man, David went through hell to get to heaven. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord again. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the, to blaspheme. the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his own house. Wow. Okay, so a sword is never going to rest. There will constantly be constant battle. He's going to lose his wives. He's going to lose the child. He's going to open the door to the enemy. And he, there was something else that David's heart's desire was, was to build the house of the Lord. And the Lord said, because your hands are not clean, because of this, you can never build my house. That's why Solomon built the house of the Lord, not David, because of what he did here. A fatal decision. Amen? You know, people don't realize that God had specific plans for me and you, and there are certain things that we made these fatal decisions that he had to change things around. What he originally had planned for me and you cannot come to pass. He has to give another plan. Amen? First Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 12, please. Let's speak it. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall be one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? In other words, in this, see, we, when our presence is still there, we still believe that we're our own. It's not until our presence is removed to where God's presence is there that we realize we're not ours, we're his. For you were bought with a, at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hebrews chapter 3. You know, think about how many times people have made, you know, it hurts my heart when I hear people that were drunk and driving and hit someone and killed them. I, when I was doing time, I ran across multiple people that were doing long time for manslaughter and because they were drinking. Now, I, I, this one guy that I knew, man, he was devastated. He, he could not forgive himself for what he did. He hated what he did. He never wanted to drink again, but unfortunately he, he hit a child and killed his child. But he himself was de devastated. That fatal decision to drink and drive affected the rest of his life. Ended up messing with his marriage and everything else. I didn't know the Lord then. I was just doing time. In my own stinking presence. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Let's speak it, please. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as in rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me 
and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was what? Angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. <clears throat> but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now remember, sin is the presence of evil. For we have become partakers of the anointing, Christ. We have become partakers of the anointing if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to where? The end. While it is said today, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. For who has, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So if you say, again, this goes back to follow. The word believe means to follow. If you say you're a believer, then you should be following. You should be exchanging your presence and following. Your desire is to be obedient in everything, not disobedient. You are constantly denying yourself. The spirit, the law, the spirit of life is with you because you're denying yourself, picking up the sword, you're battling, and you're following. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. That still blows me away in that arena where it says lovers of self. Lovers of our own presence. First Corinthians 15. <clears throat> In verse 33. Oh, hallelujah. Don't be what? Don't be what? Deceived. Don't be what? Deceived. What does it say? Evil company corrupts good habits. Well, associations bring impartations, don't they? Now, wait a minute. He says, evil company corrupts good habits. So somebody else's presence is going to affect your presence. Now, that means that you've got to exchange your presence for God's presence. Because only God's presence can overcome somebody else's presence. But if you're trying to, whatever, associate with someone with your presence and their presence, you lost. That's why evil company corrupts good habits. Does anybody get this? Oh, snap. Don't be deceived. Evil co company corrupts good habits. Awake to what? Right. In other words, get alert. Awake to righteousness and do not sin for the... For some do not have this knowledge or understanding of God. I speak this to their shame. Why? Because they should know it. Evil influence will result in fatal decisions. Again, there's that ripple effect of a fatal decision to family, children, reputation, jobs, career, marriage, and prison. Amen? And death. Some people have died by fatal decisions. 2 Timothy 4. I know multiple people that have died from fatal decisions. From getting hit by bus, hit by getting hit by cars, getting overdosing. 2 Timothy 4. Verse 1, let's speak it please. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? 
Because for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Why will they not endure sound doctrine? Because they're not exchanging their presence. But according to their own desires. In other words, now they're, if you're not exchanging your presence, then the, your presence, the desires of your old man in that presence is going to move you out of position. You will want for you and not for him. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your calling or your ministry. Wow. Itching ears will cause fatal decisions. Fa false doctrines will cause fatal decisions. I've seen people that have gone, started spirit-filled, loving the Lord, have fallen from that arena because of fatal decisions, have gone into religiosity and don't believe in demons anymore, don't believe in healings anymore after they've seen it and gone through deliverance, lost their deliverance and went all the way back and became religious and live a shrewd life. I've seen it. It blows me away. To call, what does the word said? You did. You were doing so well. What, what, you were, what, what caused you to the, do this? What, what was this persuasion that caused you to do this? Again, that person was not exchanging their presence for the presence of God. And let me tell you, that's one thing religion doesn't do. They do not exchange their presence for God's presence. Does everybody get it? They have a form of godliness. But without getting filled with the Holy Spirit, without true worship, you can't exchange your presence. So then they, they boast about how much of the word they know, but they can't even interpret it. Because the presence of God ain't there, and their presence is. And your presence isn't going to interpret this word. It's going to read it just like a regular book. And it can be interpreted carnally and not spiritually. Oh, snap. Psalm 1. Everybody there? Verse 1. Everyone say blessed. What's the opposite of blessed? Cursed. Cursed. Praise God. Blessed is the man who what? Not, well, who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Hello, who doesn't receive counsel from those who are trying to give counsel out of their own presence. <laughs> Nor stands in the path of sinners, liars. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That's hatred, perverse. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In other words, his delight is in God's presence because in God's presence there's truth. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a what? Tree, Tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf will also not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Will prosper. Yes. Blessed and prosper. Why? Because they won't make fatal decisions. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6. You know, people hear about all kinds of gossip and all kinds of things that's going on. And, they, and the enemy brings all of this stuff and then they have a, a, a flawed perception of something because of the things that they're hearing. And when they really finally search out the truth and that flawed, uh, flawed, lie, flawed perception will leave because they found the truth and now they see something totally different. It's like, whoa, man, I didn't see it that way. Well, because your presence was interfering because you're allowing everybody else's presence to influence you Amen. instead of the presence of God. Oh, hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Here's a guideline to avoid false decisions. What does it say? Do not be unevenly yoked with what? Unbelievers. Hello? For what fellowship has righteousness with? 
lawlessness? And what communion is light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Belial? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, I'll walk among them, I'll be their God. They're going to be my people if they do something for me. If they come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, and don't touch and agree with what is unclean. What is unclean. And I will receive you, and I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This is a guideline to avoid fatal decisions. Amen? I'm going to close at 2 Timothy 2. And when you don't know what to do, don't do nothing. <laughs> Remember, the enemy pushes, the Holy Spirit leads. The enemy pushes, the Holy Spirit leads. You know, one of the things I've always realized that when God does something with you, there's no strings attached. No strings attached. When it's God, there's no strings attached. I mean, you know, somebody, I remember one time this woman came over and said, I want to bless you with my car, but you have to pay the payments. I said, that's a string attached. <laughs> no strings attached. When God is blessing you with something, there is no strings attached. <laughs> and he never interrupts himself, does he? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. Hallelujah. Let's speak it. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, cleanses himself. So let me share with you. Cleansing yourself, first of all, it says repenting so that you're cleansed. The other thing is, is removing your presence so that you stay cleansed. Does everybody get it? That means you're crucifying the old, your flesh, the old man. You're putting him under submission. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, well, you know the old man can't get cleansed. The only thing he can do is get crucified. So the only way that you're going to remove his presence is to crucify him and replace his presence with God's presence. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful loss, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what? Pure heart. Now he's saying, look it. Hang around with these individuals. Why? Because my presence is with them. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach in patient and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God will perhaps grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Why? Because they made a fatal decision. Amen? Be careful. There's a fatal decision around every corner. There's a trap waiting for you to influence you to make a fatal decision. Be careful who you contact. Be careful who you associate with. Be careful what you agree with. Be careful. Amen? Amen. Be careful what you touch. Praise God. Father, we give you all glory, honor, and praise, and we thank you for the warning. We thank you. Please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive all the way through. Let this word be imparted in us, protected by the blood of Jesus, so it may grow and bear fruit for your glory and bring to remembrance in every decision we make in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.